For this lecture, we're going to talk about World War I. Uh, what we've talked about so far, we, we talk about these ideas of great world events that are affecting um, art and design and culture. And it's one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to see it. And this is not going to do it justice. Um, the horrors of war uh, are incredible. Um, there was a movie made after World War I called All's Quiet on the Western Front. Um, I really believe it's a good movie for you to watch so you can kind of understand. But we're going to just like go through some of the elements of World War I. So first, let's take a look at the uniforms. Um, I think as crazy as that sounds, uniforms are really important to understand how like governments were very much about ego and culture and this is who we are. And they had these kind of unusual ideas. And we're going to look at like some of the things that they actually made these poor soldiers wear. So the first one were the Scots. And there we can see some of the different regalia and things that they wore during World War I. Here's an animation of a Scottish uniform. Scotland had a long and unique military heritage that stretches way beyond World War I, when the traditions of the tartan and the kilt and the bagpipes became intrinsic emblems of Scottish identity. Local territorial forces played significant roles in community life, and so they, especially in rural areas, and this shared heritage and national pride led to an estimated 688,000 Scotsmen enlisting during the war. The sacrifice of Scots who served with the British Army during World War I cannot be overstated, with almost a quarter losing their lives. And this is what they sent them to war in. Just, you know, imagine what it would have been like. So, you know, not really too practical. The Brits um, had a far more practical outlook as to what they were going to wear. Here we see, you know, the different um, uh, uniforms. Um, the British wore khaki uniforms throughout World War I. These uniforms had originally been designed and issued in 1902 to replace their traditional red uniforms and remain unchanged by 1914. The change to khaki was in response to new technologies such as aerial reconnaissance and guns that didn't smoke as much, which made soldiers visible um, and, and that was very problematic on the battlefield. The tunic had large breast pockets. Um, as well as two side pockets for storage and that it could have food and artillery and so on. Rank was indicated by badges on the upper arm. And then we have uh, the French. Uh, <clears throat> again, not really taking heed to like what the British were thinking about in terms of khaki uniforms. This is the uniforms that the French sent their soldiers into. Um, unlike other armies fighting in World War I, the French initially retained their 19th century uniforms, uh, something that had been a point of political contention before the war. Consisting of bright blue tunics and striking red trousers, some warned of terrible consequences if the French forces were to continue to wear these during the war in the battlefield. In 1911, soldiers and, pol and the politician Adolf Messimi cautioned, this attachment to the most visible of colors will have nothing but the most dire consequences. After disastrous losses at the Battle of the Frontiers, a, signif a significant factor being the high visibility of the French uniforms and the propensity for those visible uniforms to attract heavy artillery fire, the decision was made to replace the conspicuous uniforms. A uniform in a drab blue known as horizon blue, so sort of like a sky blue, had already been approved in June of 1914, but was only issued in 1915. So um, now let's take a look at the Austro-Hungarian uh, uniforms. So in 1908, um, the Austro-Hungary replaced its blue uniforms of the 19th century with gray ones similar to those worn in Germany, but the blue uniforms were retained off-duty and paraded. However, while those who still had them in 1914 continued to wear them during the war. Um, also, they had summer and winter versions of its uniform, which differed in material weight and collar style. The standard headgear, meanwhile, was a cloth cap with a peak. Um, officers uh, wore a stiffer hat. Units in other areas wore fezes, like you kind of see here, instead of gray uh, fezes with fighting and red ones while they were off duty. And then we have the Russian uniforms. Um, the Russian, in general, Russia had over a thousand variations of their uniforms. So 
um, a little hard to kind of describe exactly what they wore. Um, that was just in the army. Cossacks in particular continued their tradition of a uniform distinct from the majority of the Russian army wearing traditional astrakhan hats and long coats. Most Russian soldiers typically wore a brownish khaki uniform, though it would depend on where the soldiers were from, um, where they were uh, serving and what rank or even on the materials and the fabric dyes that were available. And then we have the German uniform, and this is a good representation of that uniform. Um, at the outbreak of the war, Germany was undergoing a thorough review of all of its uniforms and something that continued throughout the conflict. Previously, each German state had maintained its own uniform, leading to a confusing array of colors and styles and badges. And in 1910, the problem was rectified somewhat by the introduction of a Feldgras or a field gray uniform. That provided some regularity, although the traditional regional uniforms were still worn on ceremonial occasions. In 1915, a new uniform was introduced, further simplified the 1910 field gray. Um, field gray. Um, details on the cuffs and, uh, and other elements were removed, making the uniforms easier to mass produce. The expensive practice of maintaining a range of, of regional uniforms for special occasions was also dispensed with. And in 1916, the iconic spike helmets were eventually replaced by the Stahlhelm, which would also provide the model for the German helmets that we see in World War II. So let's take another look now at other parts of the war. So one of the big innovations that happened during World War I were troops dug uh, trenches. So trench warfare. Um, how did trench warfare work? Well, with the development of trench warfare, increasingly large artillery was developed to fire high explosive shells and smash the enemy's trenches. Um, like these, so you can kind of see in this picture, see all those like wooden, like, like that sort of looks like railroad track. Those are all different trenches. Um, one of the, the guns that was used uh, to do a battery like this was the 9.2 inch howitzer. The majority of casualties on the Western Front were caused by artillery shells, explosions, and shrapnel. The terrible casualties sustained in open, war for, well, in open warfare, which was how the war sort of began, um, and now you remember how the uniforms sort of play into that, um, meant that trench warfare was introduced rather quickly at the beginning of World War I. Trenches provided a very efficient way for soldiers to protect themselves against heavy firepower. And within four months, soldiers on all fronts had begun to dig trenches. Although trenches protected soldiers, they also led to a state of deadlock. Trench systems um, developed significantly over the course of the war, but they also caused a lot of boredom and people were stuck in these things for like long, long periods of time. So I'm just going to show you some of the different images of trenches. There we've got, you know, an enemy artillery with um, going to be shooting at another group that's probably in a trench. And then here's another. I can't imagine. which leads us to the actual soldiers. So many teenagers fought in World War I, often lying to eager recruiters about their true ages. The youngest known soldiers were 12 years old. Nearly 250,000 teenagers would join the call to fight. The motives varied and often overlapped. Many were gripped by patriotic fervor, sought escape from the grim conditions at home, or just wanted an adventure. Um, technically, the boys had to be 19 to fight, but the law did not prevent 14 to 12 year olds and upwards joining into intros. Here's just some images of these young boys. On both sides, on all sides, all fronts. Age 14. Irish. So life on the battlefield joined from extreme boredom to intense, overwhelming agony. And it was, it was a very surreal existence, um, never encountered by any army up until that time. And so here we have, you know, some of the 
getting a haircut. On the Western Front, the war was fought by soldiers in the trenches. Trenches were long, narrow ditches dug into the ground where soldiers lived. They were very muddy, uncomfortable, and the toilets often overflowed. These conditions caused some soldiers to develop a series of medical problems, including what was become, came to be known as trench foot. So they would literally get these funguses and terrible, terrible diseases from living in such close, wet, muddy quarters. And of course, they, that part of the foot soldier's job was to get from place to place. So there was this constant, you know, having to walk. And here we can see all the socks being hung out to dry. And then soldiers trying to darn their, their uniforms. And one of the last things I want to talk about is the mud. I know, mud. So once the fields um, stopped growing food and the forests were blasted away, there was nothing left to hold the earth in place. Battlefields became mud bogs, uh, making the existence for the soldiers even more miserable and worse. The mud of the Great War was the remnants um, of human beings and of murdered nature, and the byproduct of modern industrial warfare fought on a scale that had never been seen before and even something that most people never thought was even possible. It is not the same mud that we know of today. The trenches of the Western Front were always muddy, even when it wasn't raining, it was, you know, or dry, the ground was wet. The intense and mechanical destruction of Belgium and Northern France in the First World War created a new and terrifying landscape that had hitherto only been imagined or seen in medieval, medieval um, visions of hell. One of the mud and death, unlike one of mud and death, unlike anything ever seen before. Um, the landscape of the Western Front um, was almost like an artifact, a product of human modern activity and not in any way, shape or form, a natural process. The resultant mudscape became the landscape in which the war had to be fought and lived in and was a major part of the material culture of the war. A multiple disciplinary study of this um, material culture makes it possible both to understand the war in greater detail and to see the depth in which the mud actually affected all the conflicts and the way it was fought. Almost every painting or photograph or poem or diary or book about the First World War that was written by soldiers who were there involves mud. It is as much a part of the war as ar the artillery or the trenches or the bobbed wire or the machine guns or the teenagers and their hopelessness and their heroism. And so for the rest of the uh, piece, I just want to kind of go through some pictures of this war. Yet mud as material culture from the war does not exist for modern day observers, except in the literature or the imagery. One can visit museums and they can see tanks and they can see guns and bullets and uniforms and so on. It, but it, it is even possible to visit some of the old trenches if you go to the battlegrounds in Europe and beyond, but there's no museums for the mud. It is not possible to see the mud as it was lived in and fought in and most importantly died in. The old battlefields are today either still off limits to the public or largely returned to farmland and rebuilt to their former towns and villages. Therefore, the role of the mud in the Great War is often overlooked. It's taken for granted and it's not fully understood. So the battle continues. After a quick victory was not achieved and old tactics clearly did not work, the Allied and the Central Powers continued to grind along regardless of the results. So the World War I um, was known as the Great War. It began in 1914 after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. 
This murder catapulted into a war across Europe that lasted until 1918, so about four years. During this conflict, Germany, Austria-Hungary, um, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, they were the, the central powers, fought against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Japan, and the United States. And they were called the Allied Powers. And um, here we see some more images of the war. Here's one of the large cannons that they used, carrying them across the mud. So thanks to new military technologies and the horrors of trench warfare, um, World War I saw an unprecedented level of carnage and destruction. By the, time was by the time the war was over and the Allied powers claimed victory, more than 16 million people, soldiers and civilians alike, were dead. So it's not hard for us when we think about how the, the, the ravages of this war and how it, it really pitted brother against brother you know, family against family that were living in different parts of Europe. Um, why, when our artists, our designers, our engineers, when they came home after this war and they had to rebuild their worlds, their farms, their cities, everything, why they really were against all of this idea of history, right? These proud uniforms that they were forced to wear. You know, these governments that pushed them into this for, for something that they really thought was just a land dispute and didn't need to take 16 million lives. These were blind, blind men from shrapnel. Reconnaissance with the airplanes. Hmm. And the buried of the dead. So next time, um, we're going to be looking at, at what happens after this war. So you, that's why you'll notice that I keep kind of bringing it up, and I felt like it was, only, it was really important for you to just sort of have a small grasp of the uh, travesty, the intensity that this war had on artists and on, um, on everyone, anyone, all across the world.